When Adrian asked me two or three months ago uh, to give this presentation, he was keen that I tell a story. I tell the story about the Sussex Manifesto rather than go into great detail about its contents. He particularly wanted me to address the early history. What were the relationships between Sproul and the IDS like? at the time that we got together a team, became known as the Sussex Group, to prepare this uh, so-called manifesto. Uh, and then to describe a little bit about the process of preparing the report, uh, to perhaps give a few of my own personal comments about its highlights and its shortcomings, to say something about its impact did it really change things anywhere in the world as a result of its preparation? Uh, finally, to perhaps address a little bit about, well, if we were writing the report today, how different would it be? What are the new issues which have come to our attention, or in fact have come about, since the report was prepared in 1969. It was actually published in 1970. So that's what I'm proposing to do, and I, I should say right at the beginning that this is purely my reflections on what happened. I haven't gone back to original minutes of meetings or anything. It's not a historical account, and I'm sure other people who would have been uh, participating in these events may have very much uh, a different perception of what happened. But if you can just bear that in mind and not hold me to the fact that I was out by several months on one thing or, or, or another. So that's what I'm, I'm proposing to do. When Adrian asked me two or three months ago uh, to give this presentation, he was keen that I tell a story. I tell the story about the Sussex Manifesto rather than go into great detail about its contents. He particularly wanted me to address the early history. What were the relationships between Sproul and the IDS like at the time that we got together a team, became known as the Sussex Group, to prepare this uh, so-called manifesto? Uh, and then to describe a little bit about the process of preparing the report, uh, to perhaps give a few of my own personal comments about its highlights and its shortcomings, to say something about its impact. Did it really change things anywhere in the world as a result of its preparation? Uh, finally, to perhaps address a little bit about, well, if we were writing the report today, how different would it be? What are the new issues which have come to our attention, or in fact have come about, since the report was prepared in 1969. It was actually published in 1970. So that's what I'm proposing to do, and I, I should say right at the beginning that this is purely my reflections on what happened. I haven't gone back to original minutes of meetings or anything. It's not a historical account. And I'm sure other people who would have been uh, participating in these events may have very much a, a different perception of what happened. But if you can just bear that in mind and not hold me to the fact that I was out by several months on one thing or, or, or another. So that's what I'm, I'm proposing to do. That one. Okay. What were the early things which ultimately led to the relationships that existed at the time between the IDS and SPRU? Well, as you will all know in this room, both SPRU and the IDS were started in the same year. 1966. But the origins of each of these two organizations were totally different. Uh, the IDS was created by the UK government through the Overseas Development Administration with a block grant. Uh, it happened that the uh, IDS was located at the University of Sussex after quite an intense competition between several British universities. Uh, 
whereas SPRU was started with just simply two academic posts uh, and an administrative post. Uh, Chris and myself and Jackie Fuller, who is here uh, this afternoon. Uh, our task, uh, our job was to not allocate money, because the first task for the IDS was to say, well, we have this large sum of money, how do we allocate it to achieve our objectives? SPRU had to accrete money in order to bring people on board, in order to develop a program and uh, ultimately a teaching program as well. So the first thing was how did the IDS go about allocating this block grant? They had decided that in the first instance there would be 10 senior appointments, 10 fellows appointed, uh, and I remember attending a meeting of what was called the Board of Studies, I don't think it exists anymore, but uh, there was something called the Board of Studies which met to decide on internal IDS priorities. And there was Patrick Blackett, who was the Nobel Prize winner in physics, who played an active role in uh, encouraging the development of the IDS. Uh, he was an advisor to Harold Wilson. Uh, and he and I made the case at one of these meetings why some of this block grant, at least one we were arguing for, of the posts should go for science and technology. Uh, other people were saying, no, we needed three or four economists and uh, political scientists also, and we need some people who can work on Africa and others uh, on uh, South Asia. Uh, there was a big debate and everybody was putting forward their views as to what uh, should be this allocation of post. <coughs> At the end of the day, the decision was made by the governing board of the IDS that a half of one post would go for science and technology. But that was quite a victory at the time. We had got the governing board of the IDS at one of its very first meetings to recognize that science and technology were important aspects of development and this new institute should embrace it in a small way, but it should embrace science and technology. Uh, but there was a caveat, and the caveat was that SPRU had to find the other half post. Uh, we had no money to allocate something from a, a block grant or from the university. We had to try and find the money. And we were ultimately successful by getting a grant from the Ford Foundation, which at the time was quite a large grant. Um, it was stretched over five years. And from that, we were able to match the IDS and uh, have uh, another half post so that there could be a joint fellow on science, technology, and development. And that joint fellow was Charles Cooper, <coughs> many of you uh, will remember, I'm sure.